everybody and welcome back to my <laughs> hey everybody and welcome back to my channel my name is Shakia for those of you who don't know and today I'm back with another video for you guys today I'm gonna do a story time about the first time I've worked with a DOC patient client um, whatever we want to call her for this video so for those of you who don't know in addition to running circle which is my own doula group um, I volunteer at the local hospital once a month I do a 12-hour shift um, and so the way that it goes is like you sign up for a 12-hour shift in advance and then if no one's on the schedule and they need help they'll just send a mass email or mass test saying like hey can you come in and help this mom so I started doing this about two years ago and one of the major reasons that I like to volunteer at the local hospital as a doula is because I get to work with women who don't necessarily get um, typical doula care or may not know what a doula is and the major reason of course I get to work with the Department of Correction um, inmates offenders whatever we want to call them um, so here in North Carolina a few years ago legislation was changed which actually um, guaranteed um, inmates or offenders women let's just call them women women the right um, to have a doula while in custody if that hospital has a doula program. So, for instance, um, UNC has a doula program. So, um, women who come there to labor, um, even if they are in the custody of the state, they can have a doula if they would like one. Um, and so, I've been wanting to really work with a DLC um, woman for a long time now. And... I wasn't on call, but we got that mass text and I was like, you know what, I'm not doing anything. I'm going to go in and I'm going to help this mother. So before I went in, um, I always felt like um, DOC um, women, they typically are drug addicts. Um, and I felt like if they weren't a drug addict, they just got into a bad situation behind a guy. And so those were like my pre-judgment um and neither of those was like oh no you don't want to work with these people that's just my mindset and it was kind of like I can help them overcome that you know um and so I got the phone call and I was like you know what I'm gonna go in so I went in and um all they could tell me before I went in was that she was three centimeters and she had her membrane swept prior to me arriving. Um, so I go in, I'm like, I greet her first because she's still a patient, she's still a client, whatever you wanna call her. So I greet her first, I'm like, hey, how are you? I was like, I'm Shakia, I'm gonna be your doula. And um, she was like, okay, cool, you know, whatever. She was really nice. Um, and the officers, it's two correctional officers. It's one male and one female. And one of them, I can't remember which one, they was just like, I had on a jacket and he was just like, I had on a jacket and a book bag. And he was like, hey, how are you? And he introduced himself and he was like, can you just show me your hospital badge? So I showed him my hospital badge or whatever. And he was like, okay, cool. Like, come on in. So um, when I got in, of course, the woman was lying in the bed and she had one hand cuffed to the bed, which what they call a restraint. So she had to be restrained at all times. So she had one um, arm cuffed to the bed. And then um, the correctional officers were just sitting on the couch and they were just kind of like watching TV or whatever. And so I start asking her, I'm like, how are you? And, you know, we get to talking. I'm like, your expectations for your birth. Um, you know, do you want an epidural? Are you open to different positionings and techniques? Um, massages, walking, things of that nature, because this is my first DOC patient. I really wasn't sure what exactly they were able to do. Um, I just knew that they were entitled to a doula. So, um, she's like, you know, to be honest with you, I just kind of want you here for emotional support. Um, she's like, I'm trying to stall this labor as long as possible. Um, she said, I really don't want to go back to jail. Um, and she was like, I said, what about the epidural? And she was like, oh, heck yeah, I want an epidural. And I was like, well, when do you want your epidural? And she was just like, um, I haven't been checked in about three hours. She said, but long as I get the epidural before it's too late, I'm okay. 
So at this particular hospital, um, they actually have an anesthesiologist just assigned to labor and delivery. So um, as long as you want the epidural, you can get the epidural. It's like never too late unless you can't curl over to get the epidural or unless you can't sit still long enough through your contractions to get the epidural. Otherwise, you can get an epidural. So um, she was like, as long as I can get the epidural. And I was like, okay, do, do you have any um, previous children? You know, that affects labor. And she's like, yes, I have two, but it's been a while since she had a baby. And so I'm like, okay, like this seems like stuff that, you know, I can work with. I can definitely like get her through this, you know, like we, we got this, you know? So um, what happened? So next, um, we lay there, well, she lays there and I just, you know, continue to talk to her. So she starts opening up to me about like some of her struggles in life. Um, and long story short, she had a traumatic experience where, um, her husband at the time was involved in a car accident with their children inside and um, he ended up dying and their children were severely hurt as a result of the car accident and shortly after his death she turned to drugs um, to kind of get through what she was going through and so um, she started talking to me about you know how her drug addiction started and you know like things of that nature and she was very open because mind you the correctional officers were in the room at this time um still so she was just talking in front of them and you know i didn't judge her you know like i'm just like things happen you know like whatever like right now it's the you know we we got something bigger right now on our hands and so it worked out well and then um, I started getting deeper into conversation with her, but not about her drug use, just about like her baby. And um, I asked her, I'm like, okay, well, is your baby okay? Because she did admit to using drugs while she was pregnant. And I'm like, okay, well, um, let me take it back. This offender, she, um, she was out on she was out on probation for drugs, but she violated her probation by using drugs. And so she was out majority of her pregnancy. Actually, she was out to, to term with her pregnancy. Um, she was out on bond. So um, I asked her, I'm like, well, did you receive prenatal care? And she was like, no. Okay, so that's something. So I'm like, well, when's the last time you had a cease? Uh, um, a ultrasound completed and then she informs me that she had an ultrasound completed um the day before and that was her first ultrasound of her um of her pregnancy that was her first ultrasound and that happened while she was in state custody and that was the reason she was able to get the ultrasound because you know the state has to provide certain things for you and um, it was revealed that her baby had a big cyst on its brain as a result of like everything that was happening. And so um, that was a big shock to me. So she was just like, I just wanna let you know, like when my baby is born, everyone from the NICU is gonna be in. And she kept saying, I feel like we're having a party in here. I feel like we're having a party in here because it was so many people. It was myself, it was her, it was the two correctional officers. When the correctional officers had to switch off, it was actually four correctional officers instead of two. It was the nurses, it was the doctors, it was a lot of people in the room. And so I was like, well, if you think that this is a party, just know like you have to prepare yourself for delivery because the NICU has a set of about ten, about six people that are going to be in here in addition to everyone else that's supposed to be in here in addition to the correctional officers now because of, you know your circumstance or whatever and I just really wanted to prepare her for what was to come so she was like okay you know like we get to talking and she just informed me that you know with her situation she wants to stall labor and she just lets me know that you know she does not want to go back to jail and so this is when it starts to get hard for me because at this point I'm starting to kind of get iffy. Not iffy about my capabilities, but iffy about like her. And this is why. So it was hard to kind of like, it was hard to relate to her because A, she was a drug addict and I've never used drugs. 
And not only was she a drug addict, but I'm a big advocate of prenatal care. And because she was a drug addict, she did not get prenatal care. And as a result of her using drugs while pregnant, her baby now has complications. In addition to this, she's an offender, so she's in state custody, which means her baby is going to be left alone because one of the big conditions of her family taking the baby is that the baby had to be healthy because she was using drugs. So her family pretty much said, like, if your baby is healthy, we'll take her. If not, like, your baby has to go to the state. And I just didn't feel like that was fair. And then in addition to that, you not wanting to, you wanting to stall labor, um, so that you don't have to go back to jail you know like it was just to me it just started to seem like very very selfish and so i kind of just got quiet and i was kind of like just like trying to take myself out of this like here this is not about you like this is not your pregnancy this is not your birth this is not like this is not about you like your job is to come here and your job is to help her well, on top of all this health complications that her baby had, she also had several of her own complications, which as a result, um, they had to be precautious about doing service checks on her because of the risk of infection. So, um, she wasn't being immediately checked. And you know, with um, multiple kids, your labors tend to get faster and faster. Well, the last time she was checked was at three o'clock. And here it was 11 o'clock and they hadn't come back in and checked her and the Pitocin was up to 18 already and they hadn't like checked her at all. And it was just like, how much longer? Like, how much longer? And in my head, I'm like, yeah, this is what you asked for. You said you wanted to help these women and now you're kind of like distancing yourself. Now you're like, uh, is this too much, you know? Um, so we went through labor. She got an epidural. She got an epidural about nine centimeters. I think she was about eight to nine centimeters when they came in and checked her. Um, finally, that's when like they came in and checked her and she was eight to nine centimeters. So she went ahead and asked for the epidural. Um, baby was born. Um, it was a sad situation. If you've ever seen a baby born that's addicted to drugs, especially like heavy drugs like meth and heroin, um, it's a really sad situation. Like that, like, it's just hard to like see this baby because I always say like, if you get through labor and delivery, what your, your outcome is a healthy baby, you know, God willing, your outcome is a healthy baby. So to see an innocent baby be born to addicted to meth and heroin was just a lot for me. It was a lot for me to take in. This baby shaking, this baby turning red and purple, and this baby crying hysterically. It was a lot for me. Plus, uh, the baby being born with a cyst on his brain and no one willing to take this baby because it has health complications as a direct result of his mother's addiction to drugs and don't get me wrong like i realize addiction is just a whole nother path i realized that but for me it was a lot to take in like this isn't my everyday client like you know like it was a lot to take in um and so afterwards well during labor it was a lot um it was hard to keep her like in the present moment because she just kept saying, I feel so bad. Um, I feel so bad. But her reasons she kept saying for feeling bad was because she didn't initially want the baby. And she's like, now to know like my baby, you know, has health complications, you know, as a result of her drug usage made her, you know, really upset. And so um, the baby was born. The baby was immediately taken to the NICU. Um, mom had some complications of her own. Um, and I just remember I like after everything because she didn't get the like skin to skin, she didn't get the breastfeed, any of that. And so I just remember asking her, I was like, um, how do you feel? Like what, like what's going on with you? And while at this time, I'm not going to say I didn't care, but I really wanted to try to relate to her at some point. And so I was like, what, like, how do you feel about this? Like what, like what's going through your head? And she said, I just hope that my baby is okay. She was like, that's the biggest concern right now. She was like, I understand that I have to go back to jail. 
Um, but she said, I really just want my baby to be okay. She said, I want my baby to be healthy. And I really just want family to like come and get her so that she does not have to go to state custody um, as a direct, you know, consequence of my decision. And so um, I stayed with her for about an hour um, after, you know, they got her cleaned up and everything. Um, she was able to eat and everything. And I just told myself, like, in the future, the next time I work with a DOC patient, I do feel like I will be better equipped because now I know what it's like to have somebody on drugs, to work with someone who is a drug addict. And when I say on drugs, I mean, like, this lady was using drugs days prior because she was out on the streets like days prior. So I mean, she was using drugs all throughout her pregnancy. So I do feel like now um, I'll be better equipped to help somebody who is addicted to drugs. Um, and I also feel like I know what to expect in a sense. So it's different from the clients I work with on the everyday because these are like working moms, you know, and these are moms who don't have all of this going on. They have their own thing going on. And so now that I know that I can't necessarily relate, but my job is to keep them on the present moment, that it'll make me a better doula. When I became a doula, I signed up to help women. That's my, that was my thing, is to help women. And so I definitely feel like I can't exclude them while it may be challenging to work with them. In some instances like this, it was challenging. It was challenging to hear her say, well, I feel like, it, what she said something she said well I feel like I'm not hurting anyone but myself when I do drugs so I don't understand why people care so much and that really made me upset because as I said she has two prior she has two children already and those children are in the custody of family because of her drug use and now you have another one coming and this baby has health complications as a result of your drug use so how is that only affecting you that's what really really like took the cake for me I was just like yeah, I, I've had it. Like, I had to walk out the room and everything. Actually, I didn't just walk out the room. I walked off the floor. I walked out the hospital. And I sat on the bench for, like, 30 minutes because I had to get myself together. Like, I had to, like, release, like, wuta for real, for real. Because this is it's just too much for my mental right now. Um, and so, yeah, like, you know, like, just being able to, like, say, like, hey, this isn't about you. Help her because as a result, a result of helping her, you're helping this innocent baby. And that's what got me the root. Um, I do feel like I would help more DLC patients. Um, I would like to help more of, like, not the addict side, but if another addict comes, I definitely won't turn them away because they're addict. Um... Overall, I would say that they get good rights while they are in the birthing process. Um, a part of that good rights, I would say, is they have the freedom to walk around, um, not just in the hospital bed or room, sorry, bed, in the hospital room, but they get to walk around the labor and delivery floor. Um, when they walk around, at least one correctional officer has to be with them, and they do call dispatch to let them know, like, hey, I'm walking with offender XYZ, we're just going to walk the floor. As part of her labor um so that was nice as i said they're restrained they have one hand cuffed to the bed at all times unless they are walking or unless they are using the restroom um they are always with one male and one female um correctional officer um at any time during it during the process a male officer will walk out if like a female's body is exposed no matter what what is exposed um, so, you know, the hospital gowns, they typically open in the back. So, at one point, the offender didn't want to have another gown in the back, you know. So, you wear one going, look, the back is open, and then the other, the front is open. Um, but she didn't want to wear two gowns. So, um, the officer had to keep stepping out because she was exposed. Um, another thing is like when they keep coming in to find the baby heartbeat, um, heart rate on the monitor, um, and you know, they have to like play with the monitor to find it. They have to lift up her gown. The officer would have to step out. He can't just turn his head or look the other way. No matter how minor it is, if her skin is exposed, he has to step out. Um, the first offender, the first officer stepped out anytime she went to the restroom because she had the back out of her gown. So he would have to step out for that. 
um, she was restrained to the bed at all times, like I said, unless she was walking or unless, um, unless she was going to the restroom, um, with the exception of pushing. When it got time to push, the officer did release her, her arm, um, so that she could hold on or do whatever she needed to do while birthing. Um, and, you know, her time was very short-lived with her baby because, like I said, it was just like, this is your baby, and they rushed her baby to the NICU. So she didn't get to spend a lot of time and immediately following um, the, baby, um, the baby being taken or whatever. She was um, restrained again. Um, she was able to eat normally hospital food um, until she got Pitocin, which she did not take advantage of. Um, so for those of you who don't know, Pitocin is a drug that's used to make contractions stronger. Um, and so you can pretty much eat what you want, nothing too heavy, but you can pretty much eat what you want until you get Pitocin. And once you get Pitocin, you're put on a clear liquid diet. So that includes like Jello, popsicles, um, ginger ale, water, things of that nature. So I kept telling her, I was like, girl, you better eat this food. She had a she had a salad with like grilled chicken on it. I was like, girl, you better eat this food because um, you know, like sooner you're not gonna be able to eat if you want the Pitocin. And she was like, I'm really not hungry anymore. I'm not hungry. She was like, I was so hungry now I can't eat, whatever. So she didn't take advantage of eating. So then when she got the Pitocin, she went to eat and the nurses was like, it's too late to eat. So she could eat whatever she was fed, like hospital-wise. Um, and then, you know, on labor and delivery floors, we do have like soda, such as um, ginger ale and Coke. Um, but the soda comes in a can. So because she was a vendor, um, the can is considered contraband because it can be sharpened, you know, the aluminum part. So for her, I just had to go get a cup with some ice and pour the soda into it. So she had like a paper cup. So it wasn't like such a big deal. I would say she was treated really nicely. Um, the correctional officers treated her with the utmost respect. Um, even the second round, you know, they were a little more stricter, you know, as far as like policy wise went, but they were really nice. Um, and ultimately they wanted the best for her and her baby. And that's really all we can ask for. So my advice to doulas going forward who may be put in this situation, y'all stay in the moment. Don't let the circumstance get the best of you. The same way you preach to your clients, stay positive. This isn't going to last forever. Like you have to tell yourself that too, like mentally, like, and if you need a break, take that break. Because if I didn't take that break, I would have been pissed off. Okay. I wouldn't have lasted the whole time. Cause I'm telling you, I was pissed off. So take that break, do what you need to do, but just remember like, this isn't about you. And while you may not be able to relate to her situation because you've never been in this situation or your everyday circle is not in this situation, just know that this is bigger than you. Like this is just another birth that another innocent baby. And if you can help that, that mother, therefore helping that baby, then that's our role. That's our responsibilities. So I'm going to end the video right here. If you have any more questions, you can leave them below. Sorry, I don't know why I'm about to start laughing. You can leave them below. If you have any more questions, as always, hit the like button. If you're not already subscribing to the channel, go ahead and subscribe. And I'll see y'all in the next video. Bye.